Hello and good evening in India, good morning and good afternoon around the world. On behalf of Population Foundation of India, it is both my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to the 15th JRD Tata Oration, happening virtually for the very first time, given the unprecedented times we are living in. It is a special day for us, we turn 50 today. These are difficult times, no doubt, but we draw strength and inspiration from the 50 years that we have completed today, from hardship and challenges faced as well as overcome in times past. Population Foundation of India instituted this lecture series in 1990, inviting eminent national and international leaders to focus on critical issues related to population, development and national progress. In 1995, the series was renamed the JRD Tata Memorial Oration in memory of its founder chairman. As I said earlier, today is a very special time for us, our 50th foundation anniversary. In October 1970, Mr. J.R.D. Tata laid the foundation for an independent body to work with government, galvanize civil society, action and respond to the challenge of the population. We continue to draw inspiration from J.R.D.'s vision, words and wisdom. We strongly believe that if our founding fathers were here today, they would be proud to see the difference Population Foundation of India has made to the lives of millions of people, particularly girls and women. In February, we commemorated our 50th birthday in the presence of Mr. Ratan Tata. His being there was a fitting testament to our long-standing association with the Tata legacy. The occasion was originally planned to mark the commencement of a series of events celebrating for our golden jubilee years. But all that was interrupted by the pandemic. Over the years, Population Foundation of India has adapted to the changing needs of the times and found lasting solutions to the challenges society is facing. Today, the world grapples with probably the greatest humanitarian and public health crisis in present history. As a public health organization, working on empowering women, men and young people, we have been supporting the government in its emergency response to COVID-19. Our efforts have included ensuring prioritization of essential health services, supporting smaller organizations at the grassroots to meet essential needs of the most marginalized communities, ensuring an informed discourse and preventing spread of misinformation on COVID-19. We develop targeted social and behavior change communication campaigns to fight the stigma surrounding the disease and we generated and disseminated evidence on the differential impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable populations such as women and young people. We continue to create an impact in these challenging times to strengthen those who are most in need. Let's watch some glimpses from our journey over the last 50 years. Change. How does change happen? When does an idea become a movement? When does hope become reality? At Population Foundation of India, we believe that change must be just and equitable and is only possible when we work together. And this is what we have done for the past 50 years. Founded 50 years ago, 
by a group of missionaries led by J.R.D. Tata and Dr. Bharat Ram. J.R.D. Tata received the United Nations Population Award in 1992 for initiating the family planning program in India. I was motivated by nothing more, more important than by kind of personal protest against the continuing poverty of most of my country's people. The subject became, for me, unimportant as that is, a personal obsession which still haunts me. It has been 50 years since Population Foundation of India made this vision a reality. Over the years, Population Foundation of India's work has focused on the reproductive health and rights of women and young people. Population Foundation of India's advocacy efforts after the tragic Bilaspur incident paved the way for a paradigm shift improving reproductive health services, family planning, quality of care and public accountability. This commitment to women's health and quality of care ensured that the public health system improved and reproductive choices expanded. Community Action, a key pillar of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare's National Health Mission, places people at the centre of the process of strengthening the public health system. As the Secretariat to the Advisory Group on Community Action, PFI's work enables communities to demand and access their health services. Stepping up for women and young people is key to PFI's work. In 2013, PFI launched Makuj Bikar Sakti Hoon, an entertainment education program dealing with family planning issues. It was launched on Doordarshan and then it was dubbed in about 11 languages. So it was also shown on regional networks of Doordarshan. Uh, it was broadcast on 262 radio stations, digital platform, artificial intelligence chatbot. Overall, it had a huge reach across the country. The real test of a program is the impact on the ground. And it is here that my Kujbi Kar Sakti Hoon is very special. Lat Kuwar Kushawa, a young girl from Buddhel Khan MP, became the first girl in a village to go to a college. Nirma Devi from Patna convinced her husband to use condoms and then became a champion of family planning in her village. The women of Bairia from Bihar meet every week to discuss domestic violence. That is the true test of a good television program. PFI works with young people to create safe spaces that empower them to take informed decisions about their health. I am going to go to the village and go to the village. I am going to go to the village and go to the village. In our village or in other villages, as many girls and girls, they can do their own mind. Now, I would first like to congratulate the Population Foundation of India for the very meaningful contribution and commitment they have made over the last 50 years. In our mission, the journey is the purpose and the destination stretches beyond forever. We stand committed to achieving our goals with all the resources and strength we have. A dream never ends and it will come true. We are committed to stepping up beyond 50 years of Population Foundation of India. Today, we are absolutely delighted to have with us Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, who very kindly accepted our invitation to deliver the 15th JRD Tata oration. I have known Soumya for a very long time and admire her journey. Soumya was 
only the second woman scientist to head ICMR in its over 100 years existence. We are proud that she was the first Indian to be appointed Deputy Director General supporting the Director General of the WHO. And now she is the Chief Scientist in a new department of the organization. Another first. It is a delight to be celebrating our 50 years with her. Soumya received her academic training in India and the United Kingdom. She is known as a global leader in research on tuberculosis and HIV with over 30 years of experience in clinical care and research. What is very special about Soumya is that all her research has translated into impactful programs. As a member of numerous WHO and global advisory bodies and committees, her intellectual contribution to public health, strategic thought, innovation and intellectual property is widely recognized. In her lecture, Soumya will, I am sure, provide critical insights from a public health perspective on how India can overcome the intersecting challenges of health and sustainability to build a strong, equitable and inclusive society, all in line with a commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals. May I now invite Soumya to deliver the 15th Tata Memorial Oration. Dr. Soumya Swaminathan's lecture is titled Reimagining Health Lessons from the Pandemic. The moment, Soumya, we've all been waiting for. Let's listen in. Greetings from the World Health Organization. I'm Dr. Soumya Swaminathan. President and Board of Trustees of the Population Foundation of India, Dr. Poonam Mutreja, and all the staff and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to say how honored and privileged I am to be invited to deliver this oration in the name of one of the great Indians, J.R.D. Tata, and also that it's the 50th year of the Population Foundation of India. We know the principles by which Mr. Tata lived his life and his dedication to uh, society, to serving society through being a businessman, investing in women and children, investing in education and other social services. And the fact that he was way ahead of his time he was recognized by the UN Population Fund with a Population Award and was one of the founding members of the PFI. The Tatas have continued the tradition of social responsibility at the same time as keeping an eye on the cutting edge of science and technology and trying to link the two. So thank you for inviting me to do this. Of course, it's an unusual time and we're all connected remotely, but I will try to do justice to the vision of Mr. J.R.D. Tata um, by trying to address the issues that we are faced with today with the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly as it relates to health systems, to women and children's health, and to see how we can what are the lessons we've learned and how can we take our learnings forward, um, especially as we look at improving our health, looking at achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is health for all and which is the same principle on which WHO was founded 70 years ago. What I'd like to do is perhaps go through uh, just a couple of slides on the global situation. This, of course, changes on a weekly basis, but we can see some trends. And then I'd like to go over what's happening uh, in terms of women and children's health, specifically in India, 
and, and how COVID is perhaps impacting on that and then come to what we can do looking ahead. So you can see on this slide that the global pandemic is marching on. You can see the total number of, uh, of cases really increasing week by week. Today, I think we have almost 300 new, new 300,000 new cases a day with average five to 6,000 deaths. The split you see in the different colors is the regions, the WHO regions, and you can see the region of the Americas in yellow, which has really been um, the predominant share of infections. But the purple, the Southeast Asia region, is not far behind. Um, the black line is the number of deaths, which has more or less stabilized at about 5,000 a day. But again, that's far too many. We are losing 5,000 people every day. Three countries actually account for 70% of the cases, and these are India, USA, and Brazil, with a number of other Latin American countries also in the top 10. And we are beginning to see worrying increases in some of the European countries that had actually the infection controlled. So the UK, France, Spain, Russia, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, and so on. So the bright side is there are a few countries around the world which were very fast to act, which acted early, and which were able to contain it to a level at which it's practically negligible with occasional clusters. And of course, these are countries in the Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific region. So if you look at the graph, in the bottom right hand side, which is in pink, the Western Pacific region, of course, it all started in China. But subsequently, most of the countries there have been able to keep it at fairly low levels, as I said, with clusters occurring, which then need to be attended to. Now, this is a world map showing the cases reported in the last one week per million population. And the darker the color, the more impacted the country. You can see that most of Africa is relatively light in color, except for a couple of countries. And that's um, an enigma that people have been discussing as to why Africa, despite all the dire predictions, has been relatively um, less affected, less impacted. And it's a number of social environmental reasons, uh, including the demographics and the re relatively young population. But also we must remember the uh, very early and strict action that many countries took and also their experience with public health and especially with dealing with infectious disease outbreaks. Both the, the health workforce as well as the communities are very familiar with restrictions and, and actions that need to be taken to contain outbreaks. This graph shows again the, the deaths reported in the last seven days per million population and the darker the color, the, the higher the impact. And again, we can see that South Asia and Africa have been relatively better off in terms of deaths per million. Now, to me, what are the lessons that I have learned over the last nine or 10 months? The, the most important one is the importance of investing in public health and primary health care because uh, we see examples of countries, and I'll show you a couple later, where investments in primary health care over the past decade or two have paid off now. And on the contrary, you have high income countries where they've really been overwhelmed and haven't been able to put in place some of the mechanisms that have been needed, especially things like contact tracing and quarantining and data systems for follow up. The other major um, lesson uh, for me and a very positive one is the role of science and scientists and, and also the global collaboration that we've had between scientists to take forward um, the, the advances in knowledge in an accelerated way so that science is continuously informing our response to the pandemic and that uh, even product research and development has progressed at unprecedented rates. And as you know, we now have a number of new diagnostics, including the rapid antigen tests, a number that have been developed in India, including the ones that have been developed by the Tata Trust, supported um, diagnostic, and we are, of course, working on vaccines, which hopefully by the uh, early part of 2021, we will have uh, at least a couple of vaccines that have been proven 
to be safe and effective and that we can then start using in the most vulnerable and high risk populations. Political and will and leadership, I'll mention later why it's so important, as well as trust, community engagement and empowerment, exposing societal inequalities and inequities. This the pandemic has done. So basically it's thrown up, whether it's the Black Lives Movement in the United States or whether it is the disproportionate toll on ethnic minorities in the UK, many countries have seen these inequities exposed. And finally, I want to talk about managing what we now call the infodemic. But first, let's talk a little bit about maternal and child health, which is uh, PFI's very core uh, mandate. Now, maternal mortality, um, uh, we know, has reduced. So we made a lot of gains and progress, especially during the MDG era. We reduced infant mortality. We now I think more than 80% of births are attended by skilled health personnel. Of course, this varies a little bit between states. And big initiatives in the National Health Mission like the Janani Suraksha Yojana and the Janani Shishu Suraksha Karyakram have encouraged women to give birth in health facilities. On the other hand, only a fifth of women receive all the antenatal checkups that they are supposed to have. 62% of mothers receive postpartum care two days after delivery and if you look at social groups, especially if you look at the SC, ST and OBC communities, then less than 50% of women seek ANC care. We have made a lot of progress in, in uh, achieving the replacement fertility levels. Several states in India have now achieved the replacement levels of 2.1. But there are still ongoing challenges. There's a high unmet need for family planning. It's estimated that about 30 million married women who uh, wish to delay or avoid pregnancy and do not have access to use contraceptives. And less than half of Indian women in the reproductive age group actually use modern contraceptives. And particularly youth and adolescents, 31% of India's population are aged 15 to 24 years. They need access to spacing methods of family planning, adequate counseling and good quality of care. Child marriage and teenage pregnancies remains uh, a, a, an issue. It's still common. According to the NFHS 4, 9 million girls in the age group of 15 to 19 years are married. And of course, early marriage is characterized by immediate childbearing. Teenage pregnancies have a lasting impact on intergenerational vul vulnerability as well as malnutrition. One of the reasons for having such a high rate of uh, low birth weight in India is because of the, the mothers being too young and being malnourished themselves. We still have a lot of unintended pregnancies which end in abortion and one of the uh, studies by the Guttmacher Institute um, showed that um, of the 15 million abortions that occurred in India in 2015, 73% were through medical abortion. 16% in private facilities, only 6% in public health facilities, and 5% through traditional unsafe methods. And these are the unsafe abortions which contribute also to maternal mortality. So there is an unmet need for improved access and availability of contraceptive services as well as um, abortions. Now, what about COVID-19? Now, this is having an impact on maternal and child mortality. There's been a modeling study done um, recently which showed that because of the reduction in coverage of essential services, the uh, prevalence of wasting in children could be increased by 10 to 50 percent and that, that there could be 60 percent additional maternal deaths because the uh, Interventions like the administration of uterotonics, antibiotics, anticonvulsants, and clean birth environments uh, is no longer available. So this is very worrying, and so is, of course, the impact on education. It's created the largest disruption of education system in history, affecting 1.6 billion children across more than 190 countries and all continents. 94% of the world's student population have been affected, and this is in fact almost 100% in low and low middle income countries. This year, the school year and the college year has been a washout 
for for many young people and this is a terrible situation for them particularly those who are uh, coming from the lower income groups within countries as well as those living in low middle income countries because in the higher income groups there's been some access at least to online education <coughs> whereas this is not been available for a large majority of the world's children it has also impacted on the access to nutritious food we know a number of a huge number of children depend on the school meals and during the school closures for the past 6 months they have been deprived 368 million children are missing out on school meals uh, globally we've talked about abortion and the impact that covid-19 is having partly because of uh, some of the pharmaceutical product supply chains having been impacted especially from china in the early days of the pandemic and also of course countries which have uh, laws uh, around uh, abortion there were women who used to travel to the neighboring state or city or even country to have an abortion that's not happening now so the impact of course is that there's a 10% decline in contraceptive use and there would be a large number of unwanted pregnancies that could occur as a result another very worrying um, observation is the global surge in domestic violence um leading um, the UN secretary general antonio guterres to appeal to governments to prevent a horrifying global surge in domestic violence in india um a third of women had already said that they experienced domestic violence and a very few less than 1% actually sought the help from police and of course many women believe that a husband as is justified in beating his wife um we had we've seen that the national commission for for women has uh, registered a number of uh, cases uh, after the lockdown began but it it's quite possible that the hidden cases are far higher because women would not have had access also to come forward to report these cases now what can we do about um about the impacts the gendered impacts of covid one of the things that we are seeing is that governments can do things and this is firstly by including violence against women in the package of essential services that they need to uh, that need to be continuously running even when there is an emergency and having these hotlines shelters or other specialized services to support women who ne- who may need it um we need to identify and share information on support services including opening hours and contact details establish referral linkages find out what survivors of violence need and how best to reach them safely it's these women who can actually inform us and tell us what kind of services they need when and where health workers of course play an important role by offering first line support providing medical treatment and connecting the survivors to support systems we've also seen of course the impact gendered impact of covid in terms of women who have lost their their work and their livelihoods more women than men work in the informal economy and therefore their income fell by over 60% during the first month of the pandemic and we know now the projections are that about 100 million people are going to be pushed into extreme poverty and the other projection is that more women are going to be pushed into extreme poverty than men because of this impact on the informal uh, economy in india 87 million women and girls were already living in extreme property in poverty and this is expected to increase to about 100 million by 2021 so this is really uh, very uh, worrying and again women and girls there are a higher proportion living in extreme poverty than men so the who actually came out with this advocacy brief Uh, a few months ago which really emphasizes the importance of gender analysis and uh, and uh, the gender responsive public health policies one of the major issues is the lack of availability of sex and age disaggregated data and this doesn't allow us to really to look at 
um, things from a gender disaggregated point of view. We also don't have data on violence against women and children from, from many countries. Um, the access to sexual and reproductive health services went down, as we said, and that there was increased stigma and discrimination that could affect the response. And therefore, we put out this brief basically asking our member states to do all of the below, to collect the data, report and analyze it, disaggregated by sex and age, include responses to violence against women as an essential services, maintain access to sexual and reproductive services, make sure that frontline workers and social workers, most of whom are women, have access to training, but also access to protective equipment, to PPEs and psychosocial support. Remove all financial barriers, so make COVID diagnosis and, te and testing and treatment free at the point of care and to make sure that the, that the services are non-discriminatory and we must uh, make sure that uh, whatever is being put in place in terms of emergency responses does not further promote discriminatory practices. So how can we maintain essential health services? So we did a pulse survey on the continuity of health services during the pandemic and we found that 80% of countries, of course, had defined an essential health service package and um, also a core set of uh, services. But we found that a large majority uh, of countries, even though they had these packages defined and they also had um, they had um, committed to maintain some of these essential services, but when you actually looked at additional funding that was needed to protect those essential services, you can see that in the low-income countries in particular, these were very badly affected um, compared to the high-income countries, but all countries across the board had uh, disruptions. And the reasons were both on the demand and the supply side. On the demand side, patients couldn't go for outpatient care or for inpatient care because of transport disruptions and so on, but also because they were afraid of going to health centers and picking up infections. Uh, on the supply side, of course, all the health service staff were redeployed to COVID. Um, a lot of the workforce got sick or they did not report to duty, and therefore there was closure of many of the programs. Um, and if you look at what services were disrupted, either um, to uh, partially or completely across 25 different essential health services, you can see right on top uh, is routine immunization. Uh, over 70% of countries reported uh, some partial or complete disruption of immunization services, but also a number of other things including NCD diagnosis and treatment, cancer diagnosis and treatment, uh, family planning contraception, antenatal care, malaria, TB case detection and treatment, facility-based births, urgent blood transfusions, as well as emergency surgery. So you can see that this had a huge impact, and as I had said, this was more in the low-income countries. Some of the approaches that can be used are triaging to identify what priorities we want to have people coming into the clinic, and some countries have done this, telemedicines, replacing in-person consultation, task shifting, novel supply chain and dispensing so that you are supplying drugs at home without asking people to come, community outreach, redirection of patients to alternative health facilities and so on. And then we have this document that uh, basically gives some guidance on how to maintain essential health services. Financial protection, of course, is the other side of universal health coverage. So on the one hand, you have your essential services that need to be provided. On the other side is a financial protection. Now, this obviously is uh, can be guaranteed only if there is some kind of a health coverage scheme. Either it's like Ayushman Bharat, which covers a large proportion of India's uh, population, about half uh, of the poorer segments of society, or you have private health insurance, which uh, very few uh, people in India actually have uh, access to. Now, out-of-pocket payments, I want to say a little bit about that because this still causes a large number of people, 100 million or so, to fall into extreme poverty every year. And 800 million people globally spend more than 10% of their household budget on, uh, on health care. So this is one of the goals and one of the things that WHO has been really promoting is to ensure 
um, financial protection as well as effective coverage of health services. These are the two things, elements which will produce a, a healthier population. Now, this was a recent paper that was published in the Economic and Political Weekly by Murli Dharan and colleagues from IIT Madras, looking at what's happened to out-of-pocket expenditure in India between 2014 and 18. If government health expenditure increases, then what happens? I'll show some graphs about that. And what they found is that between 2014 and 18, the cost of care, particularly inpatient care in private facilities, has risen significantly by more than 4,000 uh, rupees, which has been driving patients, even from the higher income groups, to seek expenditure from public institutions. And um, in the case of out-of-pocket uh, expenditure in public facilities, this has actually fallen. So you can see uh, for the two graphs show All India and the, the bar in black is for Tamil Nadu. We see that the share of public facilities um, which um, people had uh, acce were accessing in 2014 and again in 2018, you see that there is a dramatic increase, particularly in Tamil Nadu compared to the All India average perhaps because of the uh, quality of services that were now being delivered through public uh, outpatient facilities and also because inpatient care actually has got more um, expensive in private facility, whereas in the public health care facilities that you see on this graph, the out-of-pocket expenditure for inpatient care has come down um, all over India, both in the EAG and the non-EAG -E -E states, whereas when you contrast it with private health care facilities, you see the out-of-pocket expenditure has increased during the same time period. Now, an important point is really how do we measure coverage of universal by um, uh, these services? How do we know that it's of uh, good quality? Now, there, there's a recent paper that came out in the Lancet from the IHME group. It's a model which looked at the trajectories and then looked at what will happen between 2018 and 23 in terms of increasing U UHC coverage and comparing it to what the WHO had projected as our, as our goal, which was 1 billion more people accessing universal health coverage between these years in the five-year period. Now, we define service coverage as a spectrum of services ranging from promotion, health promotion and prevention, all the way through treatment, rehabilitation and uh, palliation. And this model actually showed that there would be an additional three, uh, let's say 400 million people who would have uh, accessed effective coverage well short uh, of the billion. And you can see different regions of the world and how things change. Uh, a UHC effective coverage index which uh, looks at uh, the provision of these services and how effective they are in terms of health outcomes. And we see that um, between 2018 and 2023 you can see that in South Asia for example it goes uh, the index goes from 46 to, to 48 and Sub-Saharan Africa from 44 to 46 and uh, and you can see on the right most corner uh, that still 3.1 billion people worldwide would not be covered uh, at the if we continue to do what we're doing now so what is it that we can do better we first need to measure effective coverage and effective coverage is not just process indicators but it you have to measure the need the use and the quality and combine that into a single metric because it actually measures the health gains that you're supposed to get from providing a certain um, coverage. Let's say it's uh, ORS for childhood diarrhea. You may provide, you may have the ORS available in health facilities. So if you measure that, you might think that you're doing relatively well. But is that being correctly deployed and given to the children who need it? And does that translate into reducing deaths due to diarrhea in children? So if you measure the mortality incidence ratio of a particular disease, you know whether the interventions are actually having the impact that they're desired. 
So, moving away from just measuring process or inputs and actually measuring the outcomes is where we need to get to. But the issue of course is that many countries do not have the data systems, they don't have the data uh, to be able to accurately measure both mortality and the incidence of certain diseases. And this is something that India needs to invest in. Our vital registration system, uh, while it's uh, the birth registration is, is very good today, registration of deaths and particularly the medical cause of death uh, registration is falls far short and we're somewhere around 20%. So we still have a long way to go. 80% of deaths in India do not have a proper documented cause of death. And so it becomes very difficult to analyze both the burden of disease, the changes over time and where policies need to focus and where resources need to be put in place. So this is an area that we need to invest in and again we need to both train people, the healthcare workers including doctors as well as use digital technology to make this happen. Now, talking of digital technologies, this is a time when many countries have actually moved into using uh, platforms to provide telemedicine, for example, uh, to get over the problem that people could not meet physically. And platforms like the ECHO platform, which have been used in many states in India to train healthcare workers, but also the e-Sanjeevani platform that's been set up by the government of India, which is enabling this telemedicine appointments to happen. And I want to tell you a little bit about the shared care appointments uh, that I saw for myself in the Arvind Eye Hospital. It's been done in many places around the world. We know that when we now have a national digital health blueprint and a roadmap and we want to move towards electronic and portable health records. But it's also very important to think about not only data governance principles, which are important, but new ways of collecting, using and sharing data, using the data to make decisions, local contextualized uh, decisions. Um, presently, the system is set up in a way that all the data feeds up and then goes into a black box or, or, or policymakers are using it at the highest levels. But the people who are actually delivering the services are not really getting any feedback on their performance or on things that they can do better or things which are actually going well. We also need to think about working with the private sector, of course, plays a very big role in, in technology. But what are those technologies that are considered, can be considered uh, public health goods, for example? Now, at the Arvind Eye Hospital in Pondicherry, they did an experiment with shared medical appointments. Again, we know specialists in India are scarce. Any sp uh, specialization you look at, the moment you go into rural areas, there's a scarcity of specialists. So what they did was, instead of a one-on-one -on -one appointment, they actually brought 10 or 15 patients with the same disease. In this case, it was glaucoma, which is a disease where the pressure and the eye builds. And the doctor then does an examination of these patients and discussion of their problem with those 10 or 15 people sitting in the same room. And this actually resulted, you can see, in the benefits both for patients as well as for providers. So it did seem to result in better health outcomes as well as higher productivity and reduce costs uh, and saving a lot of time for uh, doctors. So if we could combine virtual, that's telemedicine, with shared medical appointments, could we really try a completely new paradigm, particularly for managing people who have chronic uh, diseases? who otherwise may have to come to the doctor every month or every three months. This way, they can communicate with the doctor who can ask questions. There are 10 other people listening, say a diabetes clinic, for example. Each one is learning from the interaction. There's also a lot of peer learning that goes on. So we need to think about leapfrogging and advancing some of these things, accelerating them. Now, we talk about health system resilience a lot. And what is it? It's ability to prefer, prepare for, manage, and learn from shocks, like the one that we've all just experienced. Now, we look at shock, it has four stages. 
there's of course the initial preparedness which is what helps you to withstand it there's the shock onset and alert there's the impact and management and then there's the recovery and learning and there are many strategies for enhancing resilience which relate to better governance to financing making sure that you can suddenly upsurge in financing having proper information systems and flows resources and service delivery now this is also related so you need to prepare in advance for a resilient health system but leadership and political will have played an important role in this pandemic and we've been looking at case studies we communicate with our member states on a weekly basis they share their experiences so we have 194 ministries of health and very often it's the ministers themselves who participate and everyone has learned from each other and as i said some of the lower middle income countries actually have had lessons that could have have been learned by uh, by countries that that may have been more well off now if you look at vietnam for example what they did was a very strong and early response they activated a response system there was leadership government leadership mobilization of resources a whole of society approach and they actually managed to use their primary health care system and their community health workers to really go after clusters of cases so the first few cases were identified their contacts were traced they were isolated they were quarantined and they have actually for the first 6 months had no deaths at all due to covid so it was an incredible uh, response and even today they have a few cases but it's under control similarly thailand was one of the first countries to react because they get a lot of uh, travel from china 2 3 days after china reported the gene sequences of the novel coronavirus thailand did the same in one of the travelers who had just come back they did risk assessment and they did triaging and they told people who do not need to come to the health center to stay away and those who needed to come for emergency services they were able to provide extra surge capacity so they thought through what needed to be done and they were able to implement it now a few words about covid and nutrition we know that a uh, diverse food supply is an essential part of the health and nutrition response and they are very closely linked and disruptions in trade actually did impact uh, food systems we know that there are traditionally food insecurity hotspots as you can see most of them are in sub saharan africa some are there in uh, the eastern mediterranean region particularly those countries which have been having uh, conflict and war and then some countries in latin america as well again we really need to start now taking a systems approach to nutrition and integrating it into the socio economic response there is the poshan abhiyan in in india which is trying to do exactly this but we need to further integrate social protection systems food systems and health systems in order to really have an impact on the nutrition of individuals and families because without the um without really looking at the three as a holistic whole we are not going to be able to solve the basic structural issues as to why certain families certain uh, children or certain uh, villages remain chronically uh, undernourished now of course there's a could be a global food emergency as well because of um, these disruptions that we've had in in trade and so on and there are things that we can do to make sure that we call these services as essential services that is food production marketing and distribution make sure that we protect those workers keep trade corridors open make sure that it's part of our social protection programs and in india that's been done but probably it needs to be extended and expanded uh, protect the most vulnerable population groups tailor nutrition sensitive social protection programs either in kind or cash or vouchers or through the pds and integrate data platforms again the data on nutrition is fragmented some of it goes through the uh, anganwadi centers and sits in the ministry of women and child the other part of it comes into the health department this now needs to change and there needs to be one uh, integrated data system 
And this is a report that just came out a few months ago, again with dire warnings of worsening food security and the increase in the number of people who might actually be hungry. What are some of the unique challenges that we have faced? We've come up with this term called infodemic. It's really uh, having too much information, which includes false or misleading information, uh, mostly in the digital sphere and particularly in the social media platforms. What does it do? It leads to confusion, risk-taking, harmful behaviors, and ultimately mistrust in governments and public health response. And our Director General very early on said, Fake news spreads faster and more easily than this virus and is just as dangerous. And we are fighting not just an epidemic, but also an infodemic. So what did we do? Of course, we tried to reach out um, through webinars, um, uh, through all the expert groups that we have, our networks of collaborating institutions. We were able to amplify some of the clear and credible messages. We developed hundreds of risk communication materials and including things like myth busters and videos and animation infographics. We have um, a, a training, an open WHO where we off offer training courses to people. We've had more than 4 million people actually take those uh, training courses again in different languages. We worked with social media companies including Facebook and Twitter and um, and WhatsApp to do a couple of things. First, to make sure that they direct users to credible information. So if somebody types in something in the search, they should be directed to say their government sources in their own country or to WHO or to the Centers for Disease Control and so on, where you know you can get credible information. The second is that we started pointing out to them if we saw certain um, worrying uh, or false um, or dangerous messages and they would immediately take it down or, or po post an alert on that. And thirdly, we started doing innovations like having these chat bots and things in different languages again where people could actually chat and ask their questions and, and get credible answers again, you know, based on WHO guidance. So in the last eight months, I think we have done an incredible amount of work with the many tech companies, many of them actually doing pro bono work as well as putting advertisements out on behalf of WHO. But infodemic management is not a straightforward of, uh, business because it really is linked to people's beliefs and behaviors and the way they act. And what actually changes that? How do you, what levers do you actually uh, pull in order to change people's behavior? It's not just a question of providing information. And therefore, we've set up this behavioral insights group to really give us insights into how do you um, bring about behavior change. And I know that the Population Foundation of India has also done a lot of work on this. They have excellent outreach and communication programs. I've watched a number of their films, uh, which are basically advocacy films and coming up with very strong messages. But when you watch them, you wouldn't think so. So they are done really well. So I think that's the way that we need to communicate with people, not by just giving more facts, but by subconsciously uh, uh, to reaching them. And this is something that my good friend, Dr. Mohan Agashe, the well-known psychiatrist, actor and film director, always talks about. He says you have to, uh, he calls himself a smuggler of ideas um, because when it is through a story, when it is through film and it impacts you emotionally, the messages are actually heard and retained much better than if I were to read five facts and if someone were to tell me do this or do that. And this is very true for mental illness and mental health, but it's also true for a number of other things which actually impact personal behavior. And we are seeing today the polarized debates on whether to wear masks or not. I mean, something that is just a question of pure common sense and science is getting politicized and polarized. And every issue is, is, uh, is, is being debated in these uh, not very constructive ways. And so we need to turn to messaging which will help us to communicate the right messages to people. So finally, I think what I would like to end with is the fact that COVID-19 has underscored for us 
the importance of investing in preventive health care and primary health care. Um, again, countries which invested in primary health care in the past found themselves in a much better position to deal with. And it, within India, again, states which have invested in primary health care, which have a public health cadre and a public health department, have been able to uh, respond better. The other important point I'd like to make is that we often think about health as health service delivery. We need to start thinking a little bit upstream. The risk factors and the social and environmental determinants of health. Things like the quality of water, availability of sanitation, um, the quality of the air, both indoor and outdoor air pollution, um, road safety mental health, the housing and shelter that is available, all of these have such big impacts on our health. In fact, they affect our lifespan much more than actually having access to a health facility. So it's really important to invest in these. It's much more difficult. It lies outside the health sector. So it's really a question of all of government really looking at the impacts of their policies on health. Using telemedicine, digital uh, health to provide health care and to improve the access to health care is, I think, a no-brainer. It's happening. We need to invest. But we need to make sure we're using technology in the right way. And technology cannot solve all our problems, but it can help. It can certainly assist us. Our frontline workers are our main strength. We have more than 1 million ashas, 1.4 million Anganwadi workers and a similar number of ANMs, these are the people who do the bulk of the work and we depend on them a lot. So we need to invest in them. We need to make sure that they have the tools they need, that they have regular training, that they have mentoring, that they are protected also and, of course, well paid and looked after so that they, in turn, can do their work uh, properly. We need to invest in institutional mechanisms and capacities. Again, I can't underline this enough. Strong institutions, whether these are regulatory bodies, whether they are research institutions or whether they are the public health institutions. And by strong institutions, obviously, I'm talking about the people in those institutions. So investing in human resource capacity building. And particularly now, we can see areas where there are gaps. We need to invest in that for the long term. And again, countries that have done that have have uh, now reaped the benefits. Health literacy is very important. We've seen so much of fear, psychosis, stigma, discrimination, um, and belief in all of these false rumors which go around on social media. Health literacy has to be built up over a period of time. And this is where, again, listening to scientists, listening to public health experts becomes very important. I've talked about universal health coverage and India is on the path to investing a lot in, in universal health coverage. We need to increase that. We need to speed it up. Not just a question of financial resources, though that's very important, but also, as I said, in the human resources and also in the engaging and empowering of communities because a health system cannot only be on the supply side. It has to keep in mind how to involve on the, the, the citizens, the people that we are trying to serve and, and have them involved actually in developing the services that we, we are bringing to them. And finally, of course, this is PFI. And um, with Poonam being such a champion, I have to say that we have to keep equity, human rights, gender issues and social justice really, which need to underpin everything that we do, all programs that are devised because, again, as I've shown earlier, a lot of the indicators that we look at, health indicators, there are differentials when you look between uh, socioeconomic groups. And therefore, we need to design the programs which will lift and impact those who are currently at the bottom of uh, the pyramid. So with that, I would like to, again, thanks very much to have uh, for have, having invited me, for having given me this wonderful opportunity of honoring the memory of Mr. J.R.D. Tata by delivering this uh, oration, particularly at such a momentous time. It's the 50th anniversary of PFI and um, a wish PFI and other 50 glorious years 
we have a lot of work to do um, which spans across many of the areas that BFI actually works in and uh, I consider myself uh, lucky to be associated with you all. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you, Soumya, for both inspiring us and educating us. A great scientist in you, you speak the truth. Diagnosing a problem and finding a solution. As you have said, the impact of COVID-19 has indeed been detrimental, disrupting essential health services, causing a global surge in domestic violence and leading to an impending food emergency. We hope that all governments across the world recognize that, that, that the pandemic has underscored the need for a resilient health system. Strong government leadership and successful mobilization of resources using a whole of society approach. As you rightly said, we need to protect the most vulnerable population groups, especially women. For many of us, the key takeaway is that there is an urgent need to collect gender disaggregated data and also a need for infodemic management. Given the excessive influx of misleading and false information on COVID-19, identifying and addressing triggers of behavior change, leveraging technology and empowering our frontline workers who are the foundation of India's public health system. And finally, we need to think of societal determinants of health which impact our lives much more than having access to a health facility. You have so eloquently presented the health and development realities in this country, the challenges that need to be managed and the opportunities that need to be seized in the post-COVID-19 era. My sincere gratitude to our viewers today, which includes representatives from the government, media, civil society and our donors. Your unstinted support inspires us to move forward. And finally, a big thank you to the men and women who have come to define Population Foundation of India and our 50 years old journey. I leave you with the Population Foundation's new mantra of fortitude, guts, grit, and as we say in Hindi, Himmat. Of course, the times are tough, but there is no bridge that cannot be crossed and no mountain that can't be scaled and nothing that the human spirit cannot overcome. Do look out for and join our new campaign, Himmat Hai to Jeet Hai. If there is fortitude, we shall overcome. Be safe, happy and keep up the Himmat the fortitude. Sapne, apne, neno, himmat hai, to jeet hai, himmat hai, to jeet hai. Mushkil hai aaye, jo aaye, jo aaye, nidar bar jaye, bar jaye. जो आज तेरा सहम गया होता है तू क्यों निराश लौटेगा फिर वही जो
बढ़ जाए बढ़ जाए